Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I'm Jordan Carneyheim, the the new curator here at the ICA, and I'm so thrilled to be uh, here to welcome you all to our first See You Saturday. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Martine. I, I've been talking so much that I have already started to lose my voice, so apologies for that. Uh, I also wanted to thank, of course, um, Edra Soto and Narciso Martinez for, for being here, for gracing us with their fantastic work. Um, thank you so much for bringing this to our communities. Uh, I also have to thank Art of Elan. I hope many of you got to see the glorious collaboration performance that just happened uh, up in the Artist Pavilion, which is where Edra's show is on view. It was unlike anything I've ever seen, and we've enjoyed collaborating with them uh, throughout our entire season. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing you all to Edra Soto. Edra is our artist in residence, which means that not only do we get to enjoy her exhibition, mm -hmm. but she is here in San Diego, um, off and on for the next few months, working on projects and making herself available to our community in the gallery on uh, Saturday and Sunday afternoons. So that's, those are our Meet the Artist hours. You can find more information on our website. Um, but we have this incredible opportunity to really learn from Edra, so I encourage everyone to come back and chat with her. She's very friendly, as you will see, <laughs> and she often brings um, drinks. <laughs> so, uh, if, if I may, Edra Soto is a Puerto Rican-born artist, curator, educator, and co-director of the outdoor project space, The Franklin. She's based in Chicago, and she has shown widely, including at El Museo del Barrio, The Momentary, which is a, a satellite of the Crystal Bridges Art Museum, the Smart Museum, the Abrams Art Center, uh, and Edra is currently in the very important exhibition at the Whitney, No Hay Un Mundo Post Huracan. Uh, Edra is also the, the recipient of the 2022, um, or the Bema Center's 2022 Re Caneco Award, which is very exciting. And she'll be opening an exhibition next month called Destination, El Destino, at the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago. Um, Edra's exhibition here is called Graft, and it's a continuation of a very important project she's been working on for over a decade now. Uh, and that's what we will be discussing tonight. So thank you, Edra, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Yes. Pleasure to meet you, Andrew. I'm so, so honored to be here. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you want to tell tell the folks what, uh, oh, what we're please. drinking up here and... <laughs> maybe maybe we can yeah, have Martine help sure. pass out some or <laughs> well if uh, if you <laughs> haven't had any uh, I, yeah I, I made this for you <laughs> um, this is a, a traditional drink called coquito that is uh, typically you, you will find this drink in in people's homes uh, in Puerto Rico during the holidays and um, it I should say the ingredients in case you cannot ha you know, consume some <laughs> of this, but it's uh, rum, <laughs> and uh, it has uh, different kinds of milks, coconut milk, condensed milk, evaporated milk, and then it has uh, cinnamon and vanilla extract. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, it's, it's just something that uh, to me is kind of like a nice way of having Connect, connecting you there's a I know there's a um, component of trust in drinking something that I made <laughs> myself <laughs> so uh, but also like I I feel like it, it also set the tone for you know what I want to I want my work to embody which is celebration and even though the work can uh, you know you have a lot of um, you have a lot of thought, and it's been a years of developing. But uh, thank you. But uh, um, but I couldn't do this work without the collaboration and support of so many people. I think I I I for me to be able to, or my motivation to continue the project is that uh, once I learn something about it, I learn a detail about it, then I. Be become more interested and then it's a motivation to continue the project so a decade later 
this is what it looked like. <laughs> yeah, I think um, actually, so the fact that you've started, uh, we'll start with the drink that you're sharing with us speaks to your generosity, which is actually a, a really big part of your practice. And I would like for us to start with a, with you kind of just describing what the graft project is, and then we can get into kind of how you transform what our you know, potentially, there are architectural structures and potentially barriers into something really warm and welcoming and intimate in a lot of ways. So maybe yeah. you can tell us a little bit. Some, maybe um, we should go to the second image. Yes. Or, well, these are the pictures of the exhibition, but what there's, a, like? there's a, there, that one. Okay. So this picture that you are looking at here, this is um, the balcony of the house where I grew up. Um, it's, a, it's pretty large. Uh, part of the house is the entrance, is the welcoming area of the house, and uh, this was my my view for uh, all my all my my formative years, uh, my adult years. Um, usually, this is a mo uh, decorative motif that is is called quiebra sol, and in English it will be a, a breeze block, uh, a concrete breeze breeze block, and this is the the motifs are uh, something that, uh, that my work studies and gets information from. Yeah, so, so just to sort of wrap it up, wrap up the, the structural influences. So, so Edred bases her work on de vernacular architecture, domestic architecture in Puerto Rico that she grew up with. And this architecture that was in her home is very common um, in the city she grew up with. So these, these pattern breeze blocks and fences that surround homes are for her a really important um, kind of visual symbol of Puerto Rico, right? Yeah, I, I okay, so the project is titled Graft because um, graft, the many meanings of graft, uh, graft also means uh, skin transplant and I was looking for something that allowed me to express uh, migration. I was looking for a symbol that uh, I could represent myself with. And I, I found the, you know, the significance of, of these um, decorative patterns, be, like I'm me thinking about them as my skin because it was part of my lexicon. It's something that I, it was really engraved in my mind, in my, you know, my everyday life. Um, and, and I think discovering that they had meaning uh, ma made it significant and, and worth exploring. So graft is, becomes an architectural intervention where I will, uh, in my imagination, I'm transplanting these motifs into American territory. Even though Puerto Rico is consider American territory uh, when when you grow up in the island and then you live in the United States um, there's a, a really vast difference and that and it and then it's really hard to think about it as exactly the same so, so this so this is a project that began for you when you moved to the United States and you were looking for a language yes. to express my migration. Migration. Migration, yes. Yeah. And so it's interesting that these are, um, you know, these are architectural structures. They're, they're sturdy. They can be imposing. Um, but you've found a way to imbue them with such intimacy. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk a little bit about the, the structures um, themselves. You know, they're, they have these openings that you can sort of peer through. And then you've enhanced those by adding uh, viewfinders. So you could tell us about some of those yeah. images. So this, as you can tell, they are representations of the original concrete blocks and fences and rejas that live in Puerto Rico. I'm trying to represent something that lives there. So I, I actually never have presented this project in Puerto Rico because I'm trying to call attention to what lives there and what I consider that is an element of cultural value. And calling to that cultural value is, is a big part of the, the project. Um, so these representations um, are based on uh, 
fences that, that ex like I said, that exist in Puerto Rico, and the content that is embedded in the viewfinders that uh, are a part of the sculpture are my sources. So I, the sources of this project have over 10 years. Um, they are pictures that I take mostly with my, my phone uh, in my travelings. Um, and uh, these, these pictures became also my memory. And I think of them as narratives that I build behind the fence and that uh, they continue to evolve as, as I continue to travel throughout the, uh, you know, during the years. So um, remember a curator of photography asked me about it, uh, as if it, is this an edition, what it, you know, how you think about it. So it's, it, the archive is evolves. And uh, because if I travel back and then come back to, to Chicago or go back to Puerto Rico, there will be um, information that I capture, you know, a year, and then maybe two years later I find something else that weave into that that those pictures of the past, and it becomes this, this narrative that continues. You know, as you you grow, you continue to live, you continue to reflect on this, you know. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna I want to take us back to the image of the show just to sort of orient us um, a little bit. So this is our uh, this is Edra's exhibition that's that's on view up the hill, and you can see there are four uh, four large graft sculptures uh, on one wall. There's a smaller work uh, parallel to them, and then there are a series of paintings. And so Edra, as as part of this project that I'm now realizing is really quite autobiographical. Um, it's constantly evolving. So you say you recycle your own work all the time. Yeah, right? I, re so I repurpose a lot of the the work. If the work uh, didn't see an outcome, like it, you know, it, didn't, it wasn't sold, or it was a commission that then was a temporary commission and end up being the owner of it. Um, especially the, the work that is um, architectural, an, in an architectural intervention that it, it's made uh, responding to a site. So uh, ha having that material back, to me I really see it as material that, um, that I can repurpose. And I, and yeah, I hate to think that I, I'm going to be accumulating, you know, years of this, you know, amounts of material. So I, um, I currently have the least amount <laughs> of material in my in, in the ten years. So I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, but uh, there's always like, you know, um, um, restos or how do you call it? Like a like like re remains remains like yeah leftovers. there's always remains <laughs> but yeah the material itself i i will i will find an, a, a different use yeah. but i think what's really exciting about that is mm -hmm. that it's you know these become part of your evolving story and as, and you re and you you um you change the images each time the works are installed so there's sort of there's this ongoing reflection of your own uh, of your own experience, right, as your own kind of journey of, of migration and navigating the diaspora continues. Um, I wonder actually if we can go, I know there's a slide in here with some of the images. Oh, here are some really nice images of this kinds of source material um, you can see. And then, oh, and these are actually, so these are from inside the viewfinders. Yes. Yeah. So, so actually, Shusha took those <laughs> and when she went to the exhibition and they always look different. So if you, you saw the viewfinders embedded, uh, there's there's a meter and the purpose of the meter initially, the, I, I really didn't even think that it was, you know, a great element to add a mirror. But the, you know, usually when you are using a decorative or using decoration in a space, and these are highly decorative patterns, well, it kind of makes sense to use mirror to uh, to kind of disappear that mm -hmm. that space, um, and it 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 also have the purpose of hiding the apparatus, the viewfinder. Um, but the images that you're looking at, these are 
two examples of decorative concrete fences that exist in the um, in the neighborhood where I grew up, which was a gated community that was built during the 50s and 60s, and um, actually today, you know, there, there's a lot of these houses that are empty because people have passed, and uh, then you know maybe maybe they will have a new owner, but maybe not, uh, and. This, this is an example of the many neighborhoods uh, in Puerto Rico that are lower and middle class uh, homes. Uh, and it, it, did, it do prevail throughout the island, this, um, this aesthetic. But it's from uh, those communities. Yeah. I wanted to see if we can find um, an image of a garita. Uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, you were we, you said briefly that um, these, the these we talked briefly about how the, the motifs in the in the rejas and and quebrasolos become. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of. People. I guess oh, I'm I'm gonna go. tell you something else there's, because okay. I, I why why do I make this right? Sure. Why do I think it's important? Yes. So there's a. Um, in my process to try to understand if, if there was an importance to these particular decorative patterns, um, I you know, went into research and I found a monograph that it was written by a Puerto Rican architect that speaks about the African influence in the design build of Puerto Rico. And that in itself, you know, these are stories that are very uh, complex and and sometimes really hard to, you know, uh, um, retell. Um, but um, it really resonated to me. It made me. It actually made me think about Puerto Rican identity, the the racial conflict that it, it nonsense, <laughs> definitely nonsense. Um, and the um, and how to. How could I elevate or like uh, bring some self-esteem to these communities that live in these places um, by making this information more available to a mainstream? So like um, this, you know, all this information you can find it on my website. There's um, throughout the years we I, I had um, many contributors. The, the literary contributors of the work is, is, is a way for me to build an archive of that, uh, that, have the, that is the educational component of graft. So it's a story that is not a, you know, a single voice. It's just so many people that have contributed um, from architects to uh, scholars to artists to poets. Uh, there's all kinds of manifestations that are kind of contained in, in either uh, PDFs or newspapers that are all, uh, you know, picture and available um, in this website. But the the African influence in the design build of Puerto Rico that's what is calling upon. And then we're looking at these pictures of the military. Uh, colonial architecture of Puerto Rico that became the uh, the logo of the tourism company of Puerto Rico. So, to me, that and and that is a relationship that died over a hundred years. So this is um, a very tired, uh, I, I like a like a connection to the identity of Puerto mm -hmm. Rico, and and um, and I'm very surprised that it haven't been assess or you know like re ad address um or, the, so or these are these are um like spanish colonial fortresses yes yeah yes okay. um and um what you're looking at are you know pictures that i take uh on the uh, air at the airport in puerto rico and there's pictures of advertising uh that utilize this uh uh uh, military uh, colonial element uh, that uh, their name is Garita and this fortress is also like um, quite unpleasant to visit when you visit in person in Puerto Rico so 
I, you know, I have a, like a, a really clear picture of getting closer to that architectural space and seeing what it is, and it just, it almost feel like why, why, why that not more right. people are appalled about like this. So um, it was, it, it was also a, a, a great opportunity thinking about the relationship of. Um, I never call it vernacular because I, I think there's a, that 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 term might have I don't know some repercussions or it okay. might yeah but uh, I usually think about that uh, the decorative mm -hmm. elements uh, or decorative patterns uh, in Puerto Rico. So if we're so we're we're looking at these images and you can see this. Uh, the, the prevalence of the Garita, the watchtower, is it's here on a pack of um, sausages, right? <laughs> and you say it's like in Boston, the airport seats. Um, all the uh, trinkets in, in all tourism the trinkets, um, yeah. shops, uh, in the tourism company logo. So yeah, it's really everywhere. That's a, a banner uh, at the airport. The airport is, is small, so you go that yeah. everybody really see that, and that is like a backdrop where you can <laughs> take a picture, you can take a selfie. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, rock in the rocking chair. While yeah. <laughs> so we've um, we've talked about this a lot in the context of our our season at ICA, which is all about consumption, and you know we're asking our audience to con consider how we consume and what we consume and how that reflects our values. And so with the graphs, you're making this proposition, this offering, right, as sort of something we might consider in place of the ubiquitous colonial imagery that, uh, as you said, is 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 very out, outdated, outmoded, and, and ultimately representative not of, of the, the Puerto Rican people and their diversity. So could you tell us a little bit about how the graphs how they are offering something different? Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm they're offering. <laughs> um, yeah, I am proposing the that uh, they are uh, kind of in the in the in the foreground in the as something that that have cultural value and can become a vision of or a part of the identity and how the. Uh, the island is described because these are the elements that live in people's homes. Uh, so it will be a true connection to to the people. Let's see. <laughs> so the bus shelter that you are looking at um, also are, are quite ubiquitous you know, uh, uh, artifacts or, or pieces of architecture in Puerto Rico, they have been built um, specifically uh, by people in each county there, you will find a, a different type of, uh, you know, piece of architecture that um, it'd be, be really difficult maybe to find who, who were the the, one, the authors who, mm -hmm. who designed this artifact, but they are, um, is different from one another. This one in particular was my my source and inspiration for the one that is in display here at uh, ICA. So you can see there's a, a banner. The banner is an art piece that I that I made that is called La Distancia. But their source, I go back the to source <laughs> is this uh, piece of advertising uh, that is an advertising to sell empanadas. <laughs> But, and when I look at it, like, it almost didn't register because it's so rare to see, like, a random piece, a piece you know, of advertising on top of this, uh, you know, a sitting uh, or bus shelter, bus stop. Um, and I found that, you know, after taking a second look, I found it so brilliant, you know, that they what they are responding to is, contemporary bus shelters and the, those designs and how they integrate advertising. So um, the, you know, my bus shelter that um, have different particular uh, de details, I have this art piece uh, on top of it that was motivated by my, 
my journeys in Puerto Rico. So the sky is the sky of Puerto Rico. The woman uh, in in that uh, in that uh, print is a, a singer from Puerto Rico. Uh, her name is Yolandita, Yolandita Monge. And she, my mother was a huge fan of her. And when I visit Puerto Rico, my journey consists on going to the house where I grew up and, and travel to the place where my mother currently lives. And that, that will be my journey every single time. And the sky is the sky from that journey, and the lady is somebody that um, kind of became a vehicle in between my mom and I to to have communication after after she uh, you know transitioned into dementia and Alzheimer's, and I couldn't have conversations with her anymore. And uh, I will play music uh, that you know connects to her with her past. Thank you. How much time do we have? left just q and a's, just Q &A's. okay <laughs> thank you okay well thank you so much edra for sharing thank you um thank i also you. before i forget i need to thank Husha and roxana for all of their hard work on the show me as well Husha was incredible, incredible curator and it's been an honor to work with her she's really what yes. you <laughs> what you hope as an artist yes. and you as well thank oh, you thank, thank you. you so much thank, thank you, you. Thanks. um Thank you. So maybe we can, I don't know where, I don't see Martin, so, oh, here's Roxana. See? That incredible curatorial team, always ready. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, Roxana will take the mic, and if anybody has questions, now is a great time to ask them. Any questions? Here. Here. Oh, thank you for that question. Let's see. Um, um, yeah, I'll repeat my question. Is there a significance to the color of the bus shelter in this? Oh, the color, art? the mm -hmm. colors. I, you know, it's there's all kinds of colors in the island. A lot of people use colors that are found. <laughs> the architecture that is um, in its in its palette is more distinctive. It will be the architecture that is directed to tourists. So it will be the architecture that that is in old San Juan. All those buildings are you know inspired by colonial architecture. So that they're very different than the experience of going to a county or a municipio in Puerto Rico. So I think. But for the bus shelter, was there like a There was a choice? question for about, you ask about the bus shelter? The color of the bus shelter? Oh, the color. The significance of the color of the bus shelter, if there's any particular... Why you chose Why you chose it. Yeah. Mm, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. No, but no, no. It's, it's a color source from Puerto Rico. There's a lot of colors that are, you know, there's all kinds of colors, really. But it's a source. But it feels like home to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Do you want to sit here? Oh, yeah. hi. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I have a lot of friends who live on the island, and uh, the hurricane was devastating, uh, and yeah. the response to the hurricane was devastating. Yeah. And so I want to know what, what your response is to all the buildings that were destroyed and all you know that had a huge impact on personal friends that lived there were raised there and had to go back and take care of families that lived in structures that you are presenting yeah yeah i i was there i was there with my mother uh, uh, during the hurricane i went before the hurricane, because there was another hurricane that passed through, uh, Ir it's called Irma, and uh, um, I just went to check in with my family, and then I, I knew I had to take care of my mother at that time, and I stayed, and it was really the worst, probably the worst ex experience of my life, besides my mom having Alzheimer's now. Um, it was really horrible. I actually saw her her own transition 
uh, during that during that time, her really like uh, kind of became more clear her mental illness. This is really an emotional <laughs> subject for me. I'm sorry, but this uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, it was a really horrible. It was a really horrible. I thought it was never going to end. It's like being in your house, and it's like it's it's really it, it's so. Sh it's been pounded for for hours and hours and hours, and I, I it was really scary. It was very scary, and yeah, uh, um, the exhibition that is at the Whitney Museum right now, I really suggest every go visit, go see all the testimonies and the descriptions of the artists that are participating including mine uh they're all documented online there's been a lot of conversations um um yeah i mean it, it was it was beyond anybody's ex expectation i have gone through several hurricanes during my life living in puerto rico growing up there uh and uh by far yeah it was really um very very sad it really changed the sky changed the the landscape and the pictures that i have in the in one of the view uh the the walls that have the viewfinders will be from that time um the i i mentioned the exhibition because there's there's artists that are more maybe less autobiographical which i some you know i think sometimes about the way that i express myself and they are more act my activist minded i'm more political and there's a lot of i think information that like speaks about the things that were disclosed about that moment and the things that were uh, you know fact and fiction it's all like it's really really hard but there's a lot of there's a lot of that happening at the at the at the Whitney Museum, and that's why that exhibition is so so important. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier um, that you're only showing this work here in the U.S. And sometimes the, our daily lives, as we traverse it, we take it for granted. We don't really notice it as much. You have mentioned before that this particular work started to emerge after you moved here and you were away from the, your home. Do you feel like eventually you might want to exhibit there so that people that are around this inspiration and this architecture might be able to view it in a different perspective as opposed to just throughout their daily life? No, that, that's a great question. I think I depend more on the uh, literary components of graph for something that that could that should live there that should be shared and i think it has i think people have told me that they use it for school or like artists tell me that they are painting fences because of my work so because of you know i'm older <laughs> many of the artists that are you know that that are this this current generation I, there's a lot of artists that are making and making representations of the fences and um, I, I definitely won't give myself credit I think there's a history there and they live there they're a big part of the the identity of the people but uh, the um, but yeah artists are there's artists that have told me personally that I made this painting thinking about your work and yeah it's a true honor you know but because I because it's at the end, it's not like at the biggest community, uh, you know. Like, and I, I, I was a part of that community more actively through the, the commercial, the commercial art circuit when I was young. So um, I have a, I have a true connection with the Puerto Rican artist community. Um, but yeah, and and then hearing that from the new generation, it, it's really satisfying because I know I know there's a conversation that is not literal at the moment, but it's happening. It's it and and yeah, it, it's really it's something. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? We have for time Andra? for one more. One more. <laughs> <laughs> Pero que ustedes hacen allá. 
No, mira, tengo coquito que lo hice yo. Ay, me coquito. So, I get the last question. It is, do you do you enjoy the pace of life and the pace of change in the United States? Like, you know, the domestic yes. United States? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah, well, uh, you see, like, yeah, it's different, definitely. Yeah, I got, I got, I got, yeah. <laughs> I enjoy it. Um, I love it. I also like, you know, it, wa it was also, I mean, every, it, all, both places have their, they're just different. They're very different. Uh, when I moved to Chicago and I start, I start dating my husband who's behind. <laughs> and he, uh, he will take me to his, <laughs> parties with friends parties and there's great music and nobody's dancing and I could not understand it was driving me crazy I'm like really I came here four hours of talking I what do I want to say? I just want to yeah I don't I came to party why I feel like I'm working <laughs> so it's yeah and at least in the you know circles I I hang out I and I love, I used to love dancing. I will even, because I'm, I, yeah, might be different. <laughs> but I will go, even go dancing by myself sometimes in Puerto Rico because there was like discotheques in the San Juan and I, I, I went to study at, the, at a school that is in old San Juan right in front of that castle that I'm talking about. <laughs> and it's, it's a it's historic site that they have. The only, the only art school in Puerto Rico that you can get a, a bachelor's degree. And I spent five years there because I didn't want to leave. And I loved it. And, the, you know, I was very young. I was like 24. And I, they, there were a lot of discotheques there. And I used to love dancing. So I will, I will go after school, after going to school, I will go drive my little car uh, to the, you know, to f close. I will go up, I will dance, and then I will leave. <laughs> I will go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I needed to just do that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ICA. I love you. <laughs>